Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Today I'm going to talk about the big picture of EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. This is my model, my set of methods for what others might call human performance technology or performance improvement, but this is for improvement beyond training, beyond knowledge and skills, beyond learning. There's five major components or model sets, if you will, to the big picture of EPI. First, organizations as organized units of sets of processes. Whether, if you look at an organization chart and you saw every department on that chart, you know, underneath the functions, if you will, um, every department, every function, the enterprise as a whole is simply a bundle of processes. Some of them cross many organizational entities. Uh, some of them are contained within an organizational entity. Uh, it's just a mixed bag. So one of the things that uh, I found helpful is a way to kind of distill that down to understand you know, which processes are used across the entire organization such as the annual pro uh, budgeting process. It's something that every department must adhere to and follow and complete per the process and whatever rigor is required. The second uh, model is what I call my management areas of performance framework. Um, within that we're typically looking at four different levels or types if you will of processes. There's things that I call leadership processes, there's things that are core processes of managers when they're managing the processes that their people are working in, especially when that department owns the process. If you're loaning your people out, so to speak, to other departments to participate in the processes that they own, such as when engineers are volunteered to work with the sales organization as they go on sales calls, the sales organization owns that process and the engineering group simply supports it but they perform in those, and so that's important for managers to understand uh, as they balance workload for their people. The, the next, there's the, beyond the core processes, there's the support processes of managers. That's the third level. And the fourth level are the actual processes that are either owned or shared uh, with other organizational entities within the enterprise. Um, such as my example with the engineers working to help support sales. The third model or set of frameworks that I have in this is my epi fishbone diagram, something that I adapted based on the Ishikawa diagram which came out of uh, Japan in the 1950s and uh, kind of a, a mashup or a merging, if you will, with uh, the behavior engineering model of Tom Gilbert that was uh, part of his book, Human Competence, that came out in 1978. The fourth model that I use in all of this is my stakeholder hierarchy, or hierarchies, because it's not always the same. Uh, the fifth one is what I call the enabler provisioning systems. And so buckle up, we're gonna go a little bit deeper on each one of these things. Again, at level one, is an organization chart here in the picture that's representative of the processes that are owned in support. And what you can see in that uh, for each level of the organization, each uh, organizational unit or entity is a little model that captures the three levels, the leadership, core, and support processes of managers. And within the core processes uh, that managers are managing uh, at, a, at the core level are these uh, processes that are either owned by the organizational entity itself or are supported by the organizational entity. One needs to be cognizant of all of that in my view. Next is again my management areas of performance framework or model and here's a little bit more detail on that. There's the leadership uh, processes. Uh, these are bundles of processes. They start off with stakeholder relationship management and system governance. And what that means is that I'm going to understand all of my stakeholders, how, what their requirements are, how I am doing against all of their requirements, and then I'm going to turn around back into my own organizational entity and manage it based on what I've learned as to how well I'm actually meeting my stakeholder requirements. 
The next thing is strategic planning and management. This is where at any level here, I'm gonna take a look at the strategic plans of everybody else, especially up my chain of command, so to speak, and get aligned strategically with them. So if the organization is changing its strategic direction and goals and has articulated that differently, I've got to change my strategic plan to be in alignment, to be supportive of that. That's what that's all about. Then there's the operation planning and management. This is where you get down to the tactical level and you're doing one or two year budgeting kinds of cycles and you're setting aside resources or planning on setting aside resources to support the tactics necessary over that year's budget or a couple years view if that's what you're doing in your organization all within the context and within alignment of the strategic plans of the organization and trying to meet the stakeholder requirements that was in the first block or box of processes. The next one is results measurement planning and management. So I've got to set up some sort of a measurement system to see how well I'm doing. That's dashboards is uh, one of the terms used for that nowadays, or it's been actually popular since the 90s. Um, but so how do I know? What are the gauges that I should be looking at to see whether or not I'm on track, I'm making progress in the right direction? Are my expenses in line? Are my outputs and measures and customer satisfaction and stakeholder satisfaction all reading giving me the right readings so that I know that we're on track, that we're making pro appropriate progress. The next box is process improvement planning and management. When I see through my measurement system that things aren't going so well in certain areas, I may have to do some process improvement work and plan and manage that. And we'll see later on in this model where that actually happens. But here's the high level plans. Maybe the top of the organization, the department, the function or whatever has to decide that they're going to plan and manage some, some improvement initiative and they're gonna to have to task other people inside their own department and perhaps outside their department where they don't really have total control, but they need to articulate the plan and, and, and engage other people to get that work done. That's what's happening there. And then the last box here, uh, L6, if you will, the sixth box in the leadership tier of this model is communications planning and management. So what are my routine communications that I'm doing in order to let everybody know what's going on, how we're looking on the scorecard or the dashboard, um, what are my mechanisms for emergency communications uh, to everybody, to key targets, you know, so that needs to be, I think, ideally thought out planned, things put in place so that when you need them you're not scrambling at the last moment to figure out who to send the uh, text messages to to come into the work because you know half the building burned down and we're going to have to scramble to meet our customer commitments, our contractual commitments perhaps. Well that's the leadership. So what you're looking for when you apply this kind of model to your organizational entity are, you know, what do they call it? So change the names on the boxes. Uh, what are the key outputs and task sets, the various roles and responsibilities in order to actually do that work, perform in those processes. The next level is core and, and from a managerial standpoint, you're looking at planning the work, assigning the work, monitoring the work and troubleshooting the work. No big mystery there, management folks understand exactly what you mean by that um, and you can see that arrow then going down at the bottom of this graphic here and we'll talk about that in just a moment but before that let's again focus on what the managers are doing because that's what this model is all about management areas of performance or key results areas or major duties or accomplishments or you know many different labels for this kind of thing but in the support tier I've got process design or redesign Perhaps I'm creating a brand new process. Perhaps I'm doing that improvement we talked a little about earlier that would have come out of L5 when we're doing improvements and we've planned them. Well, this is where the, some manager, some supervisor, some lead is given the task of actually making that happen. And so this is where that happens. Um, the next one is human asset management. This has a whole raft of uh, HR kinds of activities from uh, being involved in uh, recruiting and selection, uh, job compensation studies, uh, job and organization redesign kinds of things, um, uh, training and developing people, uh, performance measurement, performance management, uh, administrating uh, compensation and benefits kinds of things. Um, there's a lot in that. And so this is where 
all the human assets, the people, and what enables and supports them and gets them available uh, and competent to perform in the processes where they're going to be deployed, that's where that happens. But it's more than just the people. The people work in an environment. So the next box, S3, is environmental assets management. So do we have all the assets that we need to put in place? Now we're going to look at a model next. Um, so take a little bit deeper look at so, you know what are all these things that uh, they're managing the human uh, assets and the environmental assets well I'll answer that in a little bit and then uh, having done um, about 25 to 30 management analyses over the four decades that I've been in this business um, what managers will tell you is that there's always this group of tasks or assignments they get which is basically special assignments um, you know, this is anything else that falls in their plate. It may be, you know, supporting the United Way or some charitable thing or supporting, supporting the local community in some ways, and managers are expected to do that. They're expected to help represent the enterprise in the local communities where they work. So that's where that would go if that's part of the job. And quite frankly, it almost always is. So um, let's now take a look at level three, the process and its environmental asset enablers um, so the the fishbone diagram that I have uh, is what represents um, that now the fishbone diagram is really called the uh, Ishikawa diagram from the late uh, Karora Ishikawa in the 1950s part of the quality movement in Japan as uh, supported by Deming and Duran and many others uh, from around the world who helped Japan come out of the dust of World War II and start producing quality products. Um, and I, I kind of merged that Ishikawa diagram, which in the non-politically correct view, circa 1980s, the early 80s when I saw this, every process uh, could be decomposed into the men, materials, methods, and machines. And I like that concept, but that didn't do enough for me. It wasn't detailed enough. So I took pretty much uh, the behavior engineering model of Tom Gilbert in his book, Human Competence, and kind of merged those things and came up with my own fishbone diagram. And you can see the elements on the spine there. Uh, what enables a process? Well, first of all, you got to you know look at the process itself and decide whether it's been designed uh, in the first place to meet the stakeholder requirements. The stakeholders requirements for the outputs produced and or the process itself. So if that's not you know, adequate, uh, good enough, then that's gotta be attended to. You really need to redesign the process first. And then you can look and see, well, what are the demands of that process? You know, a paper process, what, what kind of environmental assets need to be put in place and fed to the process in order to make it work and meet those requirements. Um, so, we can look at uh, in the environment, you know, is the data and information adequate? Are the materials and supplies adequate? Are the tools and equipment adequate? Are the facilities and grounds adequate? Is the headcount and budget that's been given to the department that owns the process, are those adequate? And is, are the culture and consequence, the consequence system in place adequate? Or is the culture and the consequence system that's actually in place, the real one, not some theoretical ideal construct, but the real one that's in place, does it punish people for doing good work? And so you may need to re-engineer your culture and the consequence system um, to get that to be supportive of what you want in the processes. And one of the things I learned from Gary Rumler and from others and from Deming also is that uh, you know, we should not look to, you know, uh, uh, ta tag the individual performers with what happens in the process, the outputs or the process itself. Um, it's usually not the individual's fault if something goes wrong. Uh, they're, envi they're in an environment where the process may not be designed very well or there'll be no one adhering to the process and that's what our problems are or the, the environmental assets are inadequate. But I've learned to hold that off and give the performer the benefit of the doubt as the late Gary Rumler taught me. Um, and, uh, but what we're, when we are looking at what the, what the human assets require, 
you know, in the case of new hires coming into the job, what awareness, knowledge, and skills do they need to have that they don't have because we didn't select, recruit and select for it in the first place, and now we're left with those gaps, and now we've got to step up to that. So what awareness, knowledge, and skills do they need? Uh, what psychological attributes do they need? What physical attributes do they need? What intellectual attributes do they need? And what personal values do they need that's conducive to the process? You know, there are people who have personal values that are not conducive to their work in a process. And that needs to be selected for carefully um, and recruited for in the first place to make sure that you're bringing people in that have as much of that that's required. But if you're going to be a sonar woman or man in the Navy, you've got to have great hearing. So deaf people can't do that job. Now there may be technology that can overcome those kinds of things if the organization is willing to do that and can um, do that at, at uh, you know, a reasonable cost. But if it's going to cost you millions and millions and millions of dollars to make up for a guy's uh, physical attribute deficit, perhaps you should give guy a different job and not put him as in the sonar man in the, uh, in the Navy, so to speak, because the consequences could be severe. You know, some submarine could sneak up and sink your ship. Having served on a ship, I, those are the kinds of things that are important to me. Um, so we can, we can look at all of those assets, the environmental, the human, the process itself, and decide where are the gaps. Um, now, one of the things that we need to look at when we're looking at uh, our, is the process producing adequate outputs and is the process itself adequate to the stakeholder requirements? There's many ways we can begin to look at stakeholders. And back in uh, 1995, I published an article with the Journal on Participation and Quality because I'd heard one too many times somebody quoting this slogan that the customer is king. And I would ask, if the customer wanted you to do something that was illegal, and your organization could get fined and your executives thrown in jail, is the customer really the king? They get to make the final decision as to what you, their supplier, their vendor is going to do? Of course not. So there are many different ways to look at stakeholders. And my intent in writing the article was to say that you need to put them into a hierarchy because certain stakeholders' requirements outweigh other conflicting requirements if they are in conflict. So if the customer wants one thing, but the government, with the power of fines and jail time, says, oh no, <laughs> you're not going to do that. You're not going to dump toxic waste into the ditch outside the, the plant because the customer wants you to do that because that's cheaper for them, reducing their costs. Um, there's some um, consequences for that, and those are applied by a hierarchy. Uh, uh, by a stakeholder that's higher in the hierarchy. So when people are confronted, uh, workers, management, confronted with conflicting stakeholder requirements, what the heck are they supposed to do? So I had empathy for them, and that was my intent to help people to begin to construct where necessary, you don't need to do this everywhere, where necessary, where, especially where you have conflicting stakeholder requirements, you need to communicate to your people, to your management, who wins in a conflicting situation. Um, that's best and fair. It leads to uh, better and faster performance, cheaper performance in the long run if you don't have to pay for those fines and everything. So one stakeholder model might put these uh, shareholders and owners on top. You know, we're working for them, shareholder value, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but wait a minute. Again, if the shareholders want you to maximize their returns by doing things that are legal in the governments of the lands where you operate, uh, they don't win. In fact, they take second place to the government. And if you're into social responsibility or what Roger Kaufman calls mega, um, you might put society at large at the top and say that even governments should be meeting the needs of society in large, at large. Um, and in fact now the shareholders take third place and their requirements, their desires, their wants, their needs fall second place uh, to government 
which themselves, in an ideal sense, in an ideal world, I guess, if you want to put it that way, to society at large. Um, there may be more movement towards looking at the needs of society at large and not worrying about governments uh, uh, insisting on certain things that have a, a negative impact to society at large. Uh, I mean, should we reduce and loosen up the rules and requirements regarding pollution of our air, our water, etc.? It's a political issue, and so I'm going to move straight on on that. Um, Lastly, I use this level five, the set of uh, models and that to look at. So if I have discovered gaps in my assets, my human assets and my environmental assets uh, that have led to me not meeting stakeholder requirements in the process or the products of the process, the outputs of the process, then I need to start looking upstream to figure out, okay, where does the fix need to take place? If it's in the inputs and the consumable materials and the equipment that's used in the process, so to speak, um, then I've got to look elsewhere. So this is my model now, the uh, enabling assets provisioning systems. And there's two groupings, uh, those that deal with the human assets and those that deal with the environmental assets. So if I'm going to address the environmental assets at the bottom here of this model, I've got information and data systems. So that's just not the IT world. That may be the corporate library. That may be all sources of data um, and information. And sometimes we're calling on data that's out in the marketplace and, and using what's free or what at, at cost and it may have nothing to do with IT, but IT is certainly a part of that, so we need to look and see what's the nature of our gap, where's that data or information supposed to come from, and then go swim upstream, so to speak, and go attend to that and fix it, and fix the processes uh, so that they're producing outputs that become inputs downstream to the process that we're focused on. There's also the materials and supply systems, uh, the tools and equipment systems, so, of course, these things aren't named as such, typically, in an enterprise, but you're going to have to look at, well, who owns the functional responsibility? And be careful, because oftentimes there's a multitude of organizations that are responsible for what's in these blue boxes here. Financial systems, do I have the headcount and budget that I need in order to support the process? Well, yes or no is the answer. There's facility and ground system. You know, do we have adequate uh, parking for our employees or are they having to park too far away? Or do we have uh, uh, facilities, uh, the proper labs and with uh, the proper number of eyewash stations should something go amiss and we need you know, so what do we really need what does the process demand in order to meet these needs and again the culture and consequences which is tricky business uh, one of the things I think I learned from Gary Rumler is that the culture is really the result of the consequence system and the consequence system is is uh, controlled by the people at the very top it's what do they allow and what don't they allow what do they reinforce deliberately or inadvertently? And what do they not reinforce deliberately and inadvertently? And so this is a management task. Uh, this always reminds me of uh, Deming and his re red bead experiment. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go investigate that and understand a little bit about what Deming was doing in that red bead experiment and why he berated people up on stage uh, who were part of his little demonstration about the red bead experiment. But when we're dealing with the humans now, we, can, we, we need to look at things such as organization and job design or redesign systems. You know, too often jobs have evolved, taken on more and more things, and weren't designed to be effective and efficient. Um, sometimes that needs to be redone. Sometimes organizations themselves have simply evolved over time and there might be a better way to organize people and the other assets in order to get the job done. That needs to be looked at. Staffing and succession planning systems. So how do we grow our own if we need uh, engineers at three different levels, entry and uh, uh, masters and super gurus, you know, how do we grow our own? Are we going to hire some in from the outside? Are we going to try to grow our own? What's our strategy for doing that? And how are we recognizing what the natural paths are for people to go from one job to the other 
And if the needs of the organization change and technology changes and we no longer need people to go work off in job A, maybe there's job D that we need to start grooming people for. And there's always a delta from where they're coming from and where they're going to. The delta is in the awareness, knowledge, and skills. And perhaps we need to train people to fill the gap. Um, back in the day, back in the late 70s and early 80s, when we talked about training and development, training was always for the job at hand. And development often meant, this was not totally consistent, often meant development for where you're going. So if you were going to come in and be a, uh, a training developer level one and you were going to go to level two, well, then how do we develop you after we've trained you for the first level of the job to the second level? And is it clear what the differences are? And can we develop you to get ready to take that job so that you're at the ready when the need occurs? Because maybe we can see that people are going to retire and we're going to need to pull five new people up from somewhere to take on that job and to fill those roles. Well, we should be developing and grooming people quite proactively, deliberately, to do that. And that's what the intent of that kind of a system is. Uh, the next one is recruiting and selection systems. So if we understand the jobs clearly and we understand what knowledge and skills are required, the goal of the recruiting and selection system should be to find people who have as much as possible and then leave the rest to the next box, training and development systems. But if we did a better job of recruiting and selecting people, then we would minimize our training costs. We'd bring people in who already know what they're doing. Now that could of course have then uh, impact later on in the compensation and benefits systems, but that's two boxes away. So performance appraisal and management systems. Again, if we have detailed understanding of what the job is, we can do a better job with performance appraisal and not appraise people on, you know, uh, side things that uh, aren't uh, quite uh, in line with what the job tasks are. If somebody's able to do the jobs and they can do it in a way where they don't offend everybody else, great. Um, perhaps we really don't care if they are a tough character, a rude person, you know, not that we want those things, but if that's got nothing to do with the job tasks, maybe that's what we want. Uh, but if the job requires dealing with other people and having interpersonal skills, maybe that's what we need to do. We need to bring people in who have the core knowledge and skills, and we simply need to tweak their interpersonal skills and appraise them and then do performance management, if you will, which is addressing people's deficits when they're not quite right. Uh, however, performance appraisal I, and management systems I fully appreciate are too often used as an excuse to get rid of people, which is really an indictment of the recruiting and selection system and management in general, um, especially if you're waiting a long time. I have a favorite story at Motorola when I was there, 1981-82. Um, there was a rule, a uh, cultural rule, if you will, and if somebody had been on the payroll at Motorola for 10 years, they couldn't be fired without the CEO's approval. Now that protected a lot of people and um, it made it harder for managers to get rid of people that had been around for a long time. So if you know, a guy had been working for you and he didn't do a good job and you tolerated him for a while, then you passed him on to somebody else who passed him on to somebody else. Guy could have ended up at Motorola for 10 years as an inadequate performer, uh, but who'd been saved by the system. Now that I'm in there at 10 years, I was safe. I didn't need to worry because who was going to go to the CEO and ask for permission to fire a guy Wallace? Well, that changed when I was there in 1981 and 82. And a video went out from the CEO to all the employees shutting down the phone system at Motorola that day and for I think a couple days after that as people got on the phone to say, oh no, did you see the rug's been pulled out of that? Um, but that was an indictment of poor management uh, if people were protected. But uh, Motorola was kind of run as a kind of a family business and the original employees were all family and the original founder or CEO of the company used to send his employees' kids off to college. I mean, it was just that kind of an organization. But uh, things were getting much more competitive for Motorola in the late 70s. And so when I arrived there, uh, there, was a, there had to be a different approach. The competition wasn't going to tolerate you carrying people who shouldn't have been on the payroll um, and should have been a, a addressed issues that should have been addressed a long time earlier. It was a, quite a transformation for that organization. 
So after performance appraisal and management systems, there's the compensation and benefit systems. And in a competitive market, you've got to offer salary and benefits that are going to entice people in the door and keep them there. Because if you're not paying market salaries and don't have market level uh, benefit systems, um, you're going to lose your people. And so you bring them in at a cost, you train and development at a cost, you're trying to groom and develop them over time at a cost. There's benefits for the organization, of course. But if you simply allow them to go out the revolving door with turnover, um, that's expensive to replace people. And so perhaps you need to look at that. Perhaps you need to raise the salaries and that'll actually net out as a positive, a benefit, a lower cost to the enterprise as a whole. That needs to be looked at. And then there's reward and recognition systems, which are similar to compensation and benefit systems, but these are usually, you know, how we reward people. Uh, salespeople may get sales bonuses for hitting certain levels and things like that, but uh, rewards and recognition are important. Some people just want recognition for the work that they're doing. Other people may be a little bit more competitive and uh, need some sort of a tangible reward besides just a attaboy and their photo in the uh, on the corporate uh, website or something uh, but so this is my model and again th what you're gonna find there's a couple of exceptions in here where you're gonna find things named differently in the enterprise you need to see if I've got an issue with people and they're inadequately trained perhaps I don't look just at the training and development organization but I look at the recruiting and selection systems to see are we bringing in the right people are we recruiting within the ranks is our uh, staffing and succession planning systems really what it needs to be. Are we deliberately growing our own to meet the needs of the organization as we see it? And when, when we can see things changing in our near-term future, are we realigning that? Are we deciding that guy's not going to go from job A to job F? He's really going to go to job L because that's where we're going to need more people. We're going to need to move people in terms of our planned succession of people within our ranks. So these are the models that I use, uh, all as part of um, my approach beyond instruction to help with enterprise process performance improvement. You know, it's that simple, I joke. Uh, of course, it's not really simple, but I'm trying to help my clients, and I, just as I help my former staff and subcontractors to ease into this human performance technology thing where we're doing evidence-based practices for performance improvement. What I do call and what I label as enterprise process performance improvement. It's my model for making improvements beyond instruction. As a self-declared performance analyst who works primarily in the instructional systems design realm, I know it's important to help my clients improve performance, even if they originally ask for training or instruction or learning. I need to have these mental models available to me and familiar to me to guide my analysis efforts. Uh, whether I'm using my uh, preferred facilitated group process where I assemble a group of master performers and other subject matter experts and supervisors and managers and sometimes novice performers to help me conduct analysis for instructional purposes and then design for instructional purposes but what they know master performers especially they know that there's these barriers out there in their performance landscape and They've developed strategies and tactics, each and every one of them, on how to deal with those barriers, how to avoid them in the first place, and what to do if they were unavoidable. And that's what I want to tap into. So, uh, and it's also important if the organization is not going to be able to fix those barriers. And so if I'm on an instructional systems design project, and I'm uncover, uncovering these things, I can't simply look to my client and say, okay, here's the uh, non-instructional, the, de the deficiencies in the environment, you have to go fix those. Well, they may not be in control of those. They may not be able to fix them. Maybe there's a plan three years later on, there's new technology that's gonna be in place that will make that all go away, So, but in three years, you're gonna have to live with it. So what do you do? Again, I tap into the expertise of the master performers who have been there and done that. They know how to avoid the barriers in the first place and they know what to do if unavoidable. 
they have those strategies and tactics. And so I need to incorporate those into my training designs at some place at some time. Maybe not at the very, very beginning, but soon. Because if people are going to go into a performance context, into a performance environment, and have to deal with those things, my role is to help my clients prepare them to do so. And that's the madness behind my methods, if you will. This is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note the subtitle, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, for yours. Just kidding. Cheers.